This is Unsupervised Learning, Red Points AI Podcast. I'm Jacob Efron, and I'm joined by my co-host Jordan Siegel. And today we had a celebrity AI guest, Arthur Mensch, the CEO and co-founder of Mistral. Mistral is at the epicenter of the AI zeitgeist right now, building one of the leading open source LLMs being used in all sorts of interesting ways. And we had a fascinating conversation. We hit on the future of AI policy, how Arthur thinks about the different products Mistral builds and where they're going next. And we also talked about the future areas of development for large language models. I think folks are really going to enjoy this conversation. Definitely stick around for Jordan and my debrief at the end. Thanks so much for, uh, for, for coming on, Arthur. Well, thank you for inviting me. I know it's a, it's a busy week, so we appreciate you, uh, you, you taking the time. Yeah, it's early in the morning, but uh, yeah, a lot of things to do after that. <laughs> Got the espresso there, so hopefully uh, good to go. You know, I think to start, it's funny, I, I, I've listened to all your podcasts before, and right? I'm not sure anyone has asked you this yet. Um, I want to ask about like the name Mistral. As I understand it, it refers to this like specific wind in Provence. Why do you name the company that? <laughs> so there's two stories. There's the, the official one and then the true one. Uh, I can give <laughs> you the official one. <laughs> so in Mistral, you have like two voyelles, which are I and A. And in French, uh, when you say artificial intelligence, you say intelligence artificielle. Oh. And so you have this Mistral AI, and so there's I, A, AI. And ah, that's, uh, cool. that's the official story. Uh, the true story is that we struggle a bit for finding a name. And then we thought about like using like primary forest names, like mountain names. And eventually we came up with Mistral and it sounded good. And I think that's for the official reason. And so we decided that it would, would be good enough. It's French. It's a French wind <laughs> blowing in the south of France. Uh, usually a cold wind, uh, but it's a wind of change. Wind of change. I like that. And then I have to ask, I mean, I feel like you've taken the, uh, you, you guys are just so good at, at kind of capturing the hearts and minds of developers. And part of that is, you know, I feel like you, you made this conscious decision to just roll out your models via torrent. And I feel like that was, people loved that. Like, how did you decide to do that? Was that something you thought about? Was it spur of the moment? So I think we collectively decided that uh, it was um so it's a joke because uh, it actually occurred before uh, with uh, Lama. Uh, Lama was, the first version of it was under a gate. And I guess some random guy just decided to put <laughs> it in a, on a torrent. And so we figured out uh, it would be a, a good uh, reminiscence of that. Uh, and it worked out pretty well. Yeah. And then how about the font? I feel like your, your logo is, uh, is, is, is a lot of fun. Uh, yes, the logo. Yeah, so we have two logos. Uh, the, first, the first logo, uh, I guess the backstory is that there was a random guy that stole our account, our account on uh, what was called Twitter at the time. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Were they trying to sell it back they, to you? They, they, took, like, they took Mistral AI and they pretended that uh, they were uh, the official account. And so we had to create another account to complain to Twitter that we were stolen our account. So we had to find a logo. And I was at a wedding. Uh, I think Guillaume was uh, also, it was during the weekend, so he was a bit busy. And so we figured out the world art would be fine. <laughs> so <laughs> I, it happened. I love that it stuck. Yeah. Well, I think it really, uh, you know, has defined the brand and I think everything happens for a reason, right? It worked out well. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when you sort of look at the landscape right now, I think it's sort of solidified between the closed source offerings, you know, you have OpenAI, Anthropic, uh, Google, and then you have sort of the open source side, you have you, Meta, you know, there's also Grok now, I guess. But how do you sort of see that evolving over the next few years? Do you think that's solidified for good or do you think it's going to change? Uh, and there will be other players, maybe. Well, we think that uh, this is going to solidify uh, with uh, the open source prevailing. That's the, we really think that this is an infrastructure technology and that at the end of the day, it should be uh, modifiable, it should be owned by customers. Uh, and so that's what we want to propose. Uh, so today we have two offerings. We have an open source one and a commercial one. Uh, this is something that might evolve, but uh, generally speaking, it's to find out the business model to sustain the open source development. Uh, and we really think that this is how it should be done. Uh, but currently, yeah, effectively, you have companies that are using uh, closed source offerings and companies that are using open source offerings. So there was a slight the gap in performance that we are actively working to close. Uh, and there was a slight gap in usability as well um, with uh, the closed source offerings that had also better software surrounding uh, on APIs and fine tuning APIs, etc. And this is also something that uh, we need to close and that we're working actively on it. On. And you recently launched, you know, the closed source offerings with small, large, and embed. How do you internally sort of decide what goes in the closed source and what goes in the open source? We need to be relevant on the two fronts. Uh, and so for the open source offering, we we went to Mixtral, we made, we released it. it. It's actually still the best model out there, mm -hmm. if you count in uh, efficiency. Um, and so that's uh, this is going to be a very moving target, I think. Uh, we released Mistral Large uh, as a portable solution, so it's available on our cloud, but when we ship it to customers, we actually give them access to the weight. So 
it's I guess the usability is similar to what you can have with an open source model. Right now, the way we think about it is that our like very best model has, uh, is shipped with commercial licenses, and our um, like the the one that are just after are actually open source. But this is uh, we're not committing to anything because it's very moving. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, there's pressure, commercial pressure, uh, there's competitive pressure on different sides, and so we're being very tactical in what we in what we do. The but our our mission is to be the most relevant platform for developers. So this is definitely setting uh, the high bar for for the open source offering, and we'll keep producing some interesting things. On the commercial side, how have you thought about like you know giving the weights to enterprises versus maybe you know obviously the other ones charge via API access? Well, there's some enterprises that know how to fine tune models, that know how to de uh, deploy models, um, and when you give access to when you license uh, the technology instead of uh, licensing the service. Uh, you allow them first to deploy where they want it to do, they want to deploy it. So they typically deploy it where their data is, and so that solves a, a bunch of issues related to uh, data governance. And then it also enables them to do the specialization they need um, and to potentially connect it to uh, well to make things that are well to make uh, applications. Uh, that are more involved than just using an API. Yeah. Uh, and so we've seen a few customers do these uh, modifications and and make them, uh, well, benefit from the access to the weights. Yeah, no, it's super cool. And I mean, you talked about kind of this enterprise platform and allowing folks to fine tune their models. And then obviously, you know, folks, you'll, you'll have a hosted solution. And I'm curious how you think about like, Obviously, you as um, Mistral can build all of this stuff, the entire developer-facing experience. We've seen kind of an explosion of infrastructure companies that are trying to do parts of this as well. How do you think about like the parts that you want to definitely build and, and own versus you know maybe partnering with other folks? So the one thing that we do best is training models. That's for sure. And this is our core offering. Um, the other thing we do well is uh, specializing models. So that's why we're moving into uh, offering some customization abilities. Um, the thing that we need to do uh, is to run inference uh, because that's uh, actually at the end of the day, having like access to a, a model file is not, not, not cutting it. And so you need to have something else. And so we have been uh, leveraging some partnerships. Uh, we, we have been building our own inference pipeline, actually. But um, this is currently, this is not the best thing we do. Uh, but this is something that we believe will, will be, it's also within the, the realm of what we should be doing. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's super interesting. And I guess, you know, with regard to those partnerships, you've obviously announced some really interesting ones recently, mm -hmm. I feel like. Microsoft, Snowflake, and all the who's who of, of, of partners you could have. Um, maybe first, like, how have you thought about, you know, your partnership strategy? Is this, should we expect a lot more announcements down the line? Uh, how, do, how does it kind of fit in? So we, we announced, uh, yeah, Microsoft, Snowflake, Databricks, NVIDIA. Um, the way we thought about it is to... Basically, look at what enterprises would need, uh, where they were operating, where the developers were operating, and figure out the channels that would facilitate adoption and spread. Uh, so optimizing for distribution, uh, making sure that if you have a developer that is on Azure and he wants to use a model and he knows about Mistral because uh, he, been, he has been using the open source models on his laptop, uh, well, just look for uh, well Mistral on, the, on Azure AI Studio and he finds it. And that's that's the very well that's the strategy we've been following to have to be a multi-platform um, solution and to replicate the solution uh, on the different platforms. Uh, obviously, the hyperscalers come to mind. Those are very natural partners because enterprises are usually customers of them. <laughs> uh, the other thing that comes to mind are data cloud providers. So that ends the, the Snowflake and Databricks uh, partnerships. It's um, enterprises have moved their data to these providers and. As it turns out, AI becomes very useful when you connect it to data and you want to do business intelligence with it. Uh, so that's that's a very natural uh, channel to use. Uh, and there's great things to be done uh, from within this platform using the AI technology we're providing. Now, it's really interesting to think about even with OpenAI, I feel like they obviously sell directly, then they have you know folks can access it via Azure. You know, It seems like similarly folks can go direct to you guys or, or go through some of these uh, other platforms. What do you, you know, what are you seeing from enterprises or what do you think the future is of, of folks that kind of go direct to you versus, you know, via some of these other places? So the small companies, uh, digital natives, uh, are oftentimes uh, willing to go to our platform directly. And the good thing is that they get like very direct support and we set up like Slack channels to uh, to support them. 
um, enterprises that, that we've been discussing with, in particular European enterprises that were the first people we discussed with, uh, typically want uh, to use our technology, but they don't want to go through the procurement process. <laughs> so that's where uh, being able to say, okay, we're on Azure. So just, just use your, your Azure credits yeah. for, for buying the technology and we'll support you uh, has, been, has been pretty um, instrumental uh, in, well, for adoption. You've been involved in a lot of advancements in AI from Palm and Chinchilla, DeepMind to now Mistral. How do you sort of view the future and like what are the next frontiers of LLMs in your mind? Well, there's still an efficiency frontier to be, uh, to be pushed. Um, the Mistral 7B was a pretty compressed model. I think we can st still do better than that. Uh, I don't think we are at the end of uh, scaling loads, so you can make mm. models that are actually <laughs> better than what we did. And uh, I don't think we are at all, we have, solved at all the question of uh, making the model controllable. Um, the, I think we've, we've done a good job at, at that, but beyond the compute that you can spend on pre-training, uh, you can make the model much stronger uh, by figuring out how to uh, just slightly tweak it so that it follows what you tell him to do. Mm. Uh, so there's still a lot of research to be done in that direction. On architectures, I'm pretty sure that we can make better than uh, we can make things more efficient than just plain transformer that spends the same amount of compute on every token uh, but obviously this is this kind of research directions uh, and yeah that's the uh, we're going to scale more we're going to be more efficient we're going to deploy models on uh, smaller devices we're going to improve latency uh, make models think faster and when you make model things faster, you're, you're opening up a lot of applications that involve calling an LLM just as a basic brick. And then you can figure out how to do planning explorations and all, all of these things. So as we improve efficiency, uh, we're opening up areas of research that are immense, I think. And, you know, speaking of compute, Meta announced, you know, 600,000 GPUs. And, you know, how do you sort of think about that relative to Mistral, especially mm -hmm. on the open source side of things? So Meta has more GPUs than we do, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, we do a good job with it. Uh, I think that's also the, the strategy of, of staying lean, of having enough GPUs per, per person. I think we have a very good concentration of GPU per person. Uh, I think this is the way to be as efficient as possible to come up with creative ways of uh, training your models. And so far, we've done a very good job with, uh, uh, with just 1.5K H100. So that's... Uh, uh, and we're going to increase, this is increasing like in the coming months. Uh, so we expect to be able to ship um, uh, better models with better compute. Going to free, like for a startup, well, a startup can't just buy 350K, uh, <laughs> uh, 800, that's, that's kind of expensive. So there's also a question of unit economics. Like how do you make sure that uh, $1 that you spend on compute, on training compute, eventually accrues to more than $1 in, uh, in revenue? Uh, and I think that's going to take time, uh, obviously, and that's why that's why VCs are there. Are there? Uh, but <laughs> but like yeah, being efficient with the training compute is actually quite key uh, in having a valid business model at the end of the day. You know, obviously, some of these other folks will just spend more on compute. You know, um, you've done an amazing job keeping up with the with state of the art. You know, throughout. Like, do you think as more and more compute goes to you know GPT five, six, seven, like? Um, what do you think the timeline ends up being for you know the Mistral model to uh, catch up? Well, I guess the, the the challenge for us is to to have enough compute to stay relevant. So we're, but we have a very good understanding of what we need to be like the best model provider. Yeah, uh, and that might involve using less compute than our competitors. Um, it's it's. A, I mean, I'm hesitant to answer that question because I'm. I mean, there's still many things that we don't know. Uh, when does it saturate? Does it oh. saturate? Mm -hmm. What do you need to do to avoid saturation because you're running out of data? Uh, so there's many unknowns, uh, which means that we are doing research to try yeah. out. Well, if you don't know, I feel like everyone points to your chinchilla work. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, chinchilla showed that you could divide by eight the, the size of the model and still get the same performance. And then what we showed with Mistral 7B is that you could get to, like, you could get a factor of six again. Uh, yeah. So that's the, and I, th I don't think we are at the end of it yet. There's obviously at some point you can't pour the entire human knowledge in like five gigabyte so <laughs> there's some trade-offs and some some asymptotes that ha that uh, that you can see that you see up here but um, i'm pretty confident that we can push that further what about like alternative architectures to transformers i feel like every so often you know we'll we'll get a pitch that's like you know ah, transformers are suboptimal on this here's like an entirely new way of doing things um any chance or you know as you think about the next decade how confident are you 10 years from now transformers will be what we're using I'm pretty confident this is not the optimal architecture. On the other hand, transformers have been out there for seven years now. 
And so that means that everything has co-adapted to it. Uh, so that includes, uh, well, the way you train it, uh, all of the training optimization algorithms, uh, the way we think about it, the way we debug it. Uh, this has, and, and also the hardware, uh, this has been very well co-adapted to transformers. And so it's hard to restart uh, and consider a new architecture and then figure out every sliders, uh, every lever that you should activate to get to the same performance of a transformer. So the ladder, the ladder climbing that we've done with transformer kind of set the bar very high. And that means that changing the architecture in a non-incremental way is actually quite challenging. And, and that's why I believe that everybody is still using that, that architecture. What we have uh, done uh, and proposed our improvement on the attention side, so how do you do sparse attention to improve uh, memory efficiency? There's a bunch of things that can be done in that direction, in that direction. But um, um, generally speaking, I wouldn't be too bullish on a on, on a startup pitch saying that they have invented <laughs> a new uh, architecture because the path is pretty long to get to the to the baseline performance. Yeah, it's good to know for us. <laughs> um, I know you gave a keynote this week at GDC. You know, speaking of the hardware side of things, what any thoughts on Nvidia and their latest chips? Well, generally speaking, it's improving. Uh, <laughs> the important thing for us is total cost of ownership. So if you have more flops and the flops at the end of the day are, are less expensive, that's great because you can train larger models. Uh, NVIDIA is moving toward very big uh, chips, uh, which is quite interesting because it's basically focusing on the training side because uh, like the, the GB200 is very useful for training. Um, it's, uh, it's expensive for sure, uh, but I think there's great things to be done with it. Um, but yeah, I think we are. The good thing about Nvidia is that improvements in terms of uh, uh, dollar per flops are pretty much predictable, uh, and so I think this new generation brings a further thirty percent improvement, basically, and that's that's great to have. Yeah, great for you guys. Um, you know, there's been a lot of activity in the last week regarding the EU AI Act. Uh, I know you've commented on the EU policy before. Um, how do you sort of see that evolving over time, and what do you think regulation should be like? So we have, um, yeah, we, we, we stated our position on, on that aspect that um, basically AI safety uh, was something to be addressed through a product safety perspective, just the same way we have addressed uh, software safety in general. So really focusing on what is the product, what is expected from the product, how do you evaluate that it works? Uh, and that's initially that's what the AI, AI Act was proposing. As it turns out, there was a lot of lobbying against the technology, uh, against I don't know LLMs becoming a uh, Bersec and uh, and and getting out of control if you were to cross a certain flop threshold, and so at the end this lobby seemed to have worked because they introduced some like technology regulation, forcing evaluation, re-teaming, all of these things. We think it's okay. I mean we're we're doing it anyway. We're, we're obviously re-teaming our models. We're evaluating them, uh, but it doesn't solve the the product safety problem because basically models LLMs are like just like a coding language, it's a program machine language, and so you can do whatever you want with it. And so you can try to evaluate it on the scope of uh, of things that you know the model can do and shouldn't be doing. But at the end of the day, it's even if you have access to these evaluations, this is not going to certify that the products that are made with it are actually safe. So for us, it's just a it's a it's a ill uh, directed burden. Um, and it's not going to improve things too much, but it's very much manageable because we are doing the evaluation and documentation part anyway. Um, on the AI Act, there's obviously some discussions around transparency of training data sets that, that we'd love to enable uh, with the caveat that uh, you need to keep some trading secrets uh, because it's a very competitive landscape. So we've been engaging in discussions around that topic. Um, we know that in the US it's evolving in like actually similar directions. Uh, it's going to be a, like a double burden because wherever you operate, you need to be compliant. Uh, but it's very much manageable. I think the issue of all of these regulations is that, yeah, again, they don't solve the actual problem on how do you make uh, an AI product safe. And the reason why they don't solve it is that it's a hard problem. Uh, you To make an AI product safe, you need to be able to evaluate exactly how it performs. And those are stochastic models. So it's, it's a different way in then we were, it differs from the way we were evaluating software before. So we need to rethink uh, evaluation. We need to rethink continuous integration, verification that everything is happening as, as it should be. Uh, and this is 
I think this is more of a technological problem, a product problem. How do you, how do we as a company give the tools to developers to make sure that uh, application makers verify uh, that their application is working as expected? It's more of a product problem than, than a regulation problem. Uh, but due to lobbying, we have seen uh, regulation come up pretty early in the process. Uh, it's very much manageable, but it's not solving anything at that point. And we see a ton of AI safety startups, eval startups. Do you think that should be handled primarily from the model layer and the companies like yourself or third-party providers? Um, it's great to see uh, this uh, ecosystem of startups doing uh, what we could call uh, middleware, uh, like observability startups. Uh, it's great to see because they, they have good ideas and, and it's a bit like the user experience, the developer experience you need to have for this kind of uh, uh, product, uh, evaluation product is, is a bit unclear. Um, this is not something that we have been doing, but uh, I think eventually that might consolidate into like a platform, an AI platform, an LLM platform should provide such kind of services at some point. And that could go through partnership or that could go through building it ourselves. And if you were like, uh, if you were whisked out of Mistral and, and you know put into government to kind of figure this stuff out, like what what would you do to kind of make the uh, you know it, it sounds like you know which makes a ton of sense. You you'd rather see the application layer you know monitored. Um, obviously, uh, maybe you go build some some eval tools that could do that. But what, what would you do if you were kind of in the policymaker's shoes? So <clears throat> I would, um, and that's what we suggested. Uh, I would put some pressure on the application makers to basically force them to verify that uh, the task that they are solving is actually well solved. So force them to do some form of evaluation, the same way you do safety testing with uh, cars. Um, and and that would put, uh, that already puts like a back, like a second order pressure to the foundational makers, to foundational model makers. Because if you want your model, if you want your application to be good enough at a certain task, you do need to verify that it solves, that the model you're, you're buying is solving. Um, and that's the, um, that's that's the way we think about it. So since application makers needs to comply with rules, uh, needs to comply with the existing regulatory framework, uh, we should be providing with tool, them with tools to comply. So evaluation tools, uh, ways of improving the model so that uh, it actually, uh, it, so that you verify that it solved the task it should be solving. Yeah, it's interesting. It sounds like, you know, if you end up regulating the application side, it will still flow back, you know, uh, to you guys ultimately because, you know, they'll just come to you looking yeah. for some of the stuff. It, it flows back and it puts some... Uh, competitive pressure because uh, obviously the, the application makers are going to pick the model that they can best control right and that puts some I think healthy pressure on the yeah. model makers totally uh, a lot whereas, of model they can best control seems well suited yeah. for, for what you guys do <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I guess the alternative that they took is to put some pressure directly on the technology but that's that's not a healthy competition because it also favors the big players uh, because they can send an army of lawyer to uh, capture the regulator the, the standard making yeah. And and that's that's the one thing we are afraid of, to be honest. I mean, I guess one one trend we've been seeing that I'm curious for your thoughts on is it feels like there's you know in recent months we've seen the foundation models for different company uh, different countries pop up like you know we've seen one in India and one in Japan and um, I'm wondering like one do you think that makes sense and two you know uh, should we expect in the future there'll be like an LLM company in every major geography or how do you think this plays out? So I think what makes sense is uh, to enable uh, countries and to enable developers in general to deploy the technology where they want to deploy it. Portability is our approach to sovereignty. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that makes sense are, is language. Because as it turns out, this is a technology that speaks languages. And uh, the entire world wants to benefit from, uh, from generative AI. And as it turns out today, models are just much, much better in English than they are in other languages. And so this is something that we have tried to address, uh, that we have started to address and that we'll continue addressing uh, in the sense that we want to make models that are great in every language. Uh, and we've started with French because we do speak French. <laughs> uh, and our models are actually, I think, pretty much uh, the best model out there in French. Uh, but uh, I think this should be this should be spread to, to the entire world. Uh, and this is an important aspect. Our approach is to be a global company, uh, but to give, uh, well, to be portable and to be multilingual so that uh, the technology we're making is ubiquitous and can be used by uh, by any companies in any part of the world. Yeah, it makes sense that, the, that you know, there'll be, you know, back to our earlier conversation of, of kind of the six or seven major model providers, that that's kind of what will, uh, you know, that's, that's probably the folks that will still be around. And the, as the models get better and better, they probably work, you know, around the world. You can have a couple of companies that are uh, specializing models on, on specific languages, but as it, as it turns out, uh, like the 
language selection and getting good at language is something that is very much on the pre-training side. So it somehow belongs to companies like ours. Yeah. Uh, and so that means that, yeah, we do need to work on it pretty heavily uh, and to, yeah, uh, have a bunch of people that can manage different languages. Totally. To me, it feels like even more of a political question than a technological one. Like, it feels like technologically, the optimal thing is to have a few folks like yourself globally. And then I think the question feels like politically, you know, are major countries going to want to have their own homegrown, you know? Well, if they can get access to the technology and be able to modify it as they want, yeah. uh, which is the way we want to distribute it, I think that's that that should be enough for them to be uh, to be confident that they control the technology, uh, and it's very so as long as they are companies that are playing a platform play and so deploying, basically shipping the models uh, to uh, various countries uh, in a distrib in a distributed way, then then I think we're good. But if you if you only have a couple of companies that are offering SaaS services, yeah. then then there's definitely a sovereignty problem, and I'm. Uh, and I think this is a sovereignty problem that has been identified uh, by many countries already. Totally. You know, I would love to just like circle back to like the start of Mistral, where you know you raised this really large seed round. There were some skeptics out there saying, "Well, there's already OpenAI, there's Anthropic." You know, what sort of gave you the confidence to go out with Timothy and Guillaume and and go start this company in the first place at that point in time? Uh, we had done it before, uh, so I think that was part <laughs> of the confidence. Uh, we had uh, secured a, a few people to join us from day one, and that also gave us the confidence that we could have a team sufficiently large to speed on. Uh, and then we saw some interest uh, in in Paris because people realized that there was actually a big pool of talent there. Uh, ChatGPT helped uh, because it increased awareness uh, in the VC world. Uh, and so we had a, we had an opportunity there, and we were confident we could we could ship very good models in a limited period of time, and so we just went for it. That's uh, that's how it happened. Yeah, I don't think there's any skeptics anymore. So definitely not. <laughs> there still are, but uh, <laughs> we'll show them. Yeah. I feel like one thing you guys did recently uh, that was fun is is you obviously uh, you know released LeChat, um, and I'm curious like does that you know do you think you'll do more kind of applications on top of models or, or how do you think about uh, about doing that? So our, our approach there is to, we realized that uh, for many enterprises didn't know how to get started. Uh, and so the best way to get them started is to show them the value and to show them that they can increase the productivity of their workers uh, by giving them an assistant that is contextualized on, on, their, on the enterprise data. And so we started with this assistant as uh, like just the V0 or something that we want to ship to enterprises, uh, which is called Le Char Entreprise. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I was scared to try and pronounce that. <laughs> I'll do it for you. <laughs> I think this is, this is quite important as an entry point. Um, it's also quite important for us to solidify the APIs behind it. So for, for instance, we have on Le Char, we have a moderation uh, tool that detects uh, input that could be deemed uh, like off, off railing the, the model and do things we want to expose uh, on the platform side. Yeah. So it's really a, a tool to be closer to the end user, to get feedback for the developer platform. And it's also a tool to, uh, well, get the enterprises into generative AI before they figure out exactly how, what they should be doing with their core business, because that's really where the value would accrue. But getting them started, showing them what they can start building through something that users can use and not only developers, uh, is the strategy we've been following so that we have these two products, but the most important one being the platform. And one thing I'm curious about, I and mean, obviously you're you know, in the weeds working with enterprises, helping them train their own you know, uh, fine-tuned versions of, of Mistral models. How, like, to what extent do the big folks have, you know, I think there's this outstanding question of like, you know, if you're sitting on tons and tons of data and you throw that out at, at kind of uh, adapting a model, is that much better than you're sitting on, you know, you're a mid-sized player and you don't have that? I'm curious, like, and I, it's probably an overly broad question, but like, to what extent do you feel like the folks that are that are sitting on tons of data have a big advantage? And uh, to what extent uh, is having some examples enough? I think that's, that's a good question. So typically you don't, uh, when you have a ton of data, you shouldn't be fine-tuning the model right away. Yeah, you should be <laughs> using retrieval augmentation uh, generation, retrieval augmented generation, and you should be thinking on how to use the context to actually empower the assistant with tools, uh, with uh, data, with the ability to do requests to some databases. Uh, so that's the, that's the first thing that you should be doing. Then the data that you could use to make fine-tuning work are more demonstration data. So traces of what uh, users uh, are doing so that you can imitate them and provide them with an assistant. 
And in that setting, I mean, we haven't seen a lot of enterprises have this data readily available. And that's something that is probably missing to make assistants that are very robust and, and reliable. Um, and I think the, so it's, it's a brand new th kind of data that you need to acquire. And in that respect, I think uh, the, the, it's, it's an even field. So companies can start acquiring it faster than others. Uh, the data they had before is is a great enabler, but uh, they should rethink their data strategy in the light of the, the co-pilots, the assistant they want to deploy. Yeah, super interesting. Well, we always like to end our interviews with a quick fire round where we get your quick takes on things. Okay. Um, you know, to start, would love one thing that's overhyped and one thing that's underhyped in AI today. Uh, one thing that's overhyped, uh, synthetic data. I keep hearing about <laughs> synthetic data. What does that mean? It's ill-defined. Uh, underhyped, uh, I would say optimization techniques. What has been the biggest surprise in building Mr. All? And then once one thing that you thought would work and didn't, and one thing that you thought didn't work, but actually did work? Uh, would work and didn't. Um, I think so far things are, have worked up pretty well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's some challenges in uh, in hiring. So we're like we're opening a U.S. office uh, for science people, and, and it's actually like getting the, the gravity uh, to to get the best profiles is actually quite hard. Uh, but we're we're starting to get there. Uh, one thing, something that surprised us and we didn't know it would work is basically we got attention more quickly than we thought, uh, and so that's that's a great problem to have. But then we. Uh, it also creates some uh, prioritization problem because you get a lot of inbound. Good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think of the latest Grok model? Um, ah, it's a big one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little too big. Uh, they, can, they can make it smaller. You don't think 340 billion parameters is uh, where it's at? Well, I mean, you can have many parameters, but then you need to have the performance that goes with the parameters. Yeah. Uh, what matters is the Pareto front uh, in between the size of the model and the, the performance of the model, and, and they are not quite there yet. They will probably improve. So you can't say Mistral for this, but which AI startup are you most excited about right now? There's a couple of Paris startups that are good. Uh, Dust is a very good startup. Uh, it's focusing on knowledge management, uh, and they have a very sleek UI, and uh, it's great to see. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's uh, I feel like you know you're at the heart of this Paris ecosystem, but it's an amazing to 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 watch it um, just you know rocket to the top of the scene. Um, I guess if if you uh, if if we said you weren't allowed to build models and you couldn't work at Mistral and you had to go build an AI application, uh, what application would you go build? Ah, uh, it's this is a very good question because that's a path that we could have taken. Um, I'm very excited about hard science, uh, but this is very much the North Face. Uh, so how do you uh, accelerate material science, for instance? It's something that we discussed before. It could have been an alternative Mistral. Uh, but how do you uh, like accelerate the synthesis of uh, ammonium, for instance, uh, which is a very carbon-intensive process today, and that could, in that could improve. Uh, and that requires a lot of exploration. You could use LLM for that, maybe. So material science, I I think it's still lacking a foundational model, and yeah. I would be uh, happy to speak to anyone that uh, is willing to make it. <laughs> awesome. Amazing. Well, we have wanted uh, to have you on for a while, and we're glad we can make this work in person. Uh, there's obviously a lot of exciting stuff going on, Mistral. Where can people go to learn more about you and, and the work you're doing? So we have uh, we have two developer relations uh, today, mm -hmm. uh, Sophia Young in particular, who joined us from the U.S., uh, and so we have been uh, working heavily on uh, solidifying the documentation, the guides, uh, to simplify the usage of our APIs. And so our documentation is a good starting point uh, to, to learn more about us. And this is going to, to grow as we, as we create more content. Well, Arthur, thanks so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, that no, was a lot of fun. So what did you think? Uh, that was a ton of fun. I mean, God, I, I feel like Mr. All is just at the center of like, you know, the AI zeitgeist right now and everything interesting and, you know, even being at NeurIPS, I feel like they were just the, the, the talk of the town. And uh, it's incredible just the the different things they're doing. Um, and Arthur's just such, yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, the first time we met him, we were like, we have to work with this guy because he's so humble and, I mean, just so smart. But yeah, I mean, I feel like every your practitioner we chat with, they're like, yeah, I'm using Mixtral. There was just so many fun parts of that interview. I love the idea that he's like, at a wedding, you know, it's over the weekend and they're trying to figure out like, what do we, you know, what logo do we launch with? And it's like, oh, I guess word art will be just fine. And <laughs> it's become kind of this like iconic uh, logo that they have. And, you know, it feels like it was funny when we asked him, you know, if anything had, had, you know, surprised him to the negative. And it's like, it just feels like all these 
you know, these decisions they make quickly just resonate so well with uh, with the with the broader community. Yeah, I also like the name part. That was pretty cool too. The Winds of Change. I think that's a pretty good name. Yeah, exactly. I like the, uh, the you know, like every good name. There's a real story, and uh, and and then, and then the actual like the the one the one that you tell the uh, the, the the press and whatnot. Exactly. <laughs> what did you uh, think of sort of the the foreign sort of policy uh, side of things? Yeah, I thought the policy side was was super interesting. I mean, it's definitely a theme we've heard throughout the, you know uh, throughout these conversations uh, is this idea of, of regulating the applications and not the models themselves. But I thought his point which makes a ton of sense is like, look, if you go and regulate the applications, the pressure is going to flow up to the models because the application yeah. makers will just then go back to their model providers and say, hey, we need X, Y, or Z. Um, and I think that actually puts, you know, if Mistral's main focus is around controllability, having the underlying weights of your models, puts them in a pretty good position to, you know, help folks adapt to different kind of regulatory regimes. Totally. I mean, the, the, he mentioned the transparency and the training data, and that's gotten a lot of attention because it's very broad. You know, it's very open for interpretation, but for a company like Mistral or OpenAI, the training data is just so vast, and how do you make that transparent? Well, it's also the secret sauce, right? right exactly. <laughs> so you don't want to totally reveal all the uh, all the company secrets. Um, and so, yeah, very curious to see how that gets implemented. And you know, it all it feels like it all comes back to eval always in these conversations. It's such an unsolved problem, and you know, it's it's I think it's points well taken that even if regulators wanted to to do things on the application side, there's you know, we don't even have the products yet or the tooling to, to really be able to to look at that. Totally. You know, speaking of eval, I mean, we see eval startups all the time. What do you think of his answer? And, you know, we may partner with that. We may just incorporate into the platform. Not really sure yet. And I, I love just how transparent and open he is about, like, we're still figuring out exactly what, like, you know, there's we basically reserve the right to be flexible here. And like when you have as much momentum as they do and you're in some, as many places, I think it's a great perspective to take. Um, and so as they think about building out this broader developer platform, um, I love the idea that, you know, certainly they'll be they'll build some stuff that they're really good at. And obviously it seems like fine tuning and, and the ability to train your own models is, is you know, real strength of the team. And then for other things, you know, they'll be the first place people look to if you're if you're using a Mistral model, you'll say, OK, what how do I what do I use, you know, to do eval or to host or whatever. And I love the idea that they can decide what of that they want to build, what they want to partner for. And, um, you know, I think we would love, you know, from our investing standpoint for him to just tell us I've chosen a partner and it's this. And we're like, great, we'll go do that. Uh, but I think, you know, the reality is everything's moving so fast that I, I love just kind of the flexibility they keep. Totally. No, I completely agree. And what do you think of, you know, we talked about, like, is there going to be a model or a company for each geo? Um, he mentioned that, you know, we're doing many languages and we're hiring for different types of uh, geos. How do you think about that? And, like, do you agree with him that maybe Mistral will just do a ton of languages and there won't be a need for, you know, a centralized company in each part? I kind of feel, I mean, I think I said this to him, like, it feels to me more a political question than a technological one. Like I do, I, I you know think from everything we're seeing, these as these models get more and more powerful and more and more generalizable, that you will have the top models be quite effective across uh, different languages. Um, I think there's a broader political question of you know, do you want the main model that's powering all these economies uh, to be you know to to just reside in, in countries that are you know sorry in, in companies that are uh, present in certain countries or as you know our major countries going to want to feel like hey we have our own provider um, and I don't know how that plays out uh, you know maybe we'll, maybe we'll have to get some more uh, political folks on the uh, yeah. <laughs> on the podcast <laughs> sounds good yeah what uh, I guess anything else that stood out for you. No, I mean, look, I, I mean, we're obviously super excited about Arthur and, and the team over at Mistral. And, uh, you know, I think every time we chat with him, we just get more and more excited about the direction and how, uh, you know, they are both really strong researchers and just making these crazy advancements, but also reminding ourselves it's like a 30 person team. Yeah. And then I thought like another really interesting part of, uh, you know, what he was saying toward the end is just his kind of interest in foundation models for material sciences. And I think this is a trend we've been seeing over yep. the past few months of, you know, obviously there's foundation models for biology, material sciences, robotics is one we've yep. seen with the announcement of, of physical intelligence. Um and I think these domains are fascinating because they seem to exhibit similar scaling laws. I think the big question is, uh, how do you generate enough data? You don't have the entire internet to go uh, to go scrape. Um, and so, you know, I think it'll be really interesting across all those areas. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad we have Arthur's like brilliant mind focused on the LLM world. But I think in a different world, uh, him going on material sciences would be pretty interesting. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> but no, I mean, I agree. I think uh, we've been seeing that a lot on the investing side. I think we're going to see more and more this year where we have, you know, real domain expertise going after foundation models for these specialized industries. So that was our conversation with Arthur. If you enjoyed that conversation and you've been enjoying the show, please consider sharing this with someone you think that would also find it interesting. We're trying to get the word out about the podcast and we have an awesome lining coming up, including next week with Ido from Pinecone. Look forward to seeing you then.